It's my great privilege and pleasure now to introduce today's presenters, Susan Campbell and Charlie Nutt. Susan Campbell, a Nakata past president, is joining us today from her home campus, the University of Southern Maine. Susan's held a number of administrative positions in her 30-year career at USM. She became the Director of Academic Advising in 1993, served as Executive Director of the Division of Advising and Academic Resources, and was promoted to her current position of Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs in 2006. In addition to her term as Nakata President, Susan has served our association through participation in regional and annual conferences as a presenter, site chair, evaluation chair, and Region 1 conference chair. She served as the chair of the Advising Administration Commission and as faculty member for the Administrators Institute. She's been a participant in the organization's professional development task force and has served as a faculty member at the Nakata Summer Institute and the Assessment of Advising Institute. Susan has also contributed to a variety of Nakata publications, including Academic Advising Today and the Guide to Assessment of Advising CD. Charlie Nutt, Nakata's Executive Director, is here in Manhattan, Kansas, broadcasting from the Nakata Executive Office. Charlie joined the team at the Executive Office in 2002, coming to the Little Apple from Coastal Georgia Community College. Charlie and Susan have been working together on this topic for several years, and we hope that many of you saw their first broadcast on this topic in September 2007. We're certain that you'll find they make a great team. I believe Charlie is going to start us off, so I'll turn the mic over to him now, and we'll begin. Thank you, Lee, and thank you for all you do for the um, webinar series. It's hard to believe this is our 26th webcast, and um, I appreciate greatly all you do to make these come about. And just want to take a moment to say how excited I am, Susan, to be presenting with you again and talking about such an important topic. It's always a pleasure to work with you, and, and this is an exciting um, opportunity for us both. So let's get started. Retention of student persistence continues to be a key issue for all institutions. This is especially true today in the present economic climate. Reaching and retaining our students, quite frankly today, more than ever, contributes to the bottom line through revenue generation, which in turn supports our campus activities and programs. So in addition to being responsible to our students and our constituencies for the academic, personal, and career success of our students, our institutions also are recognizing that reaching out to retain students can make the difference in their financial survival. This is particularly critical in this highly volatile economic and demographic change environment. Today, we're gonna to focus on the research in student retention and persistence to graduation, specifically utilizing that research to analyze and effectively, effectively communicate those issues on your campus and developing strategies for connecting research to action. In addition, we will identify steps a campus must take to build a culture where student success is part of the fabric of the campus and where academic advising is seen as key to campus student success initiatives. So let's start though by expanding a bit on why at the institutional level, it's important to be concerned about student persistence and success. Regardless of your type of institution, four year, two year, private or public, or of your student focus, first year, graduate students, distance education students, adult learners, we offer you three broadly conceived reasons why we need to be concerned about student persistence. First, college persistence and graduation rates influence the public perception of the quality of your institution which in turn affects recruitment and external funding possibilities. There is today a heightened awareness of the persistence in graduation rates among the public, particularly those with children reaching college aid years or even graduate school age. And certainly this awareness is growing among our adult learners as well. 
Institutional persistence and graduation rates play significant roles in recruitment more than ever before and in the family decisions regarding which students will ultimately attend. In addition, state legislatures are increasingly concerned about graduation rates and in some cases are introducing legislation to mandate improvements and tying funding to those improvements. Some even connecting funding to graduation and completion rates instead of the traditional enrollment numbers. Second, rates of persistence in graduation are becoming important components of program review activities, and in particular, accreditation and reaccreditation. Regional accrediting associations and outside accrediting bodies for specific programs such as business and engineering are increasingly concerned about institutional and program effectiveness, a concept which has as its major components persistence and graduation rates. Finally, focusing on student success is programmatically and financially responsible. Improving student persistence toward graduation can help to stabilize overall class size, that is the cohort sizes at the freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior levels at an undergraduate institution, for example, which in turn can allow for better scheduling, predictability, and planning. This stabilization could provide opportunities to build upper, upper divisions within majors at four-year colleges and universities, something really important in a typically low-enrolled discipline, and expanding programs at our two-year colleges. Improving student persistence can also reduce our reliance on recruitment to retain total enrollment, which always has as, it by, as its byproduct the front-loading of students and courses at the lower division. Finally, improving student persistence toward graduation can provide additional resources we must have to invest in people and programs. We would all like to be at that point on our campuses today. So as we think about these notions, it becomes clear that the economics of persistence and retention are far more than just tuition revenue. So with all that in mind, Susan, where do we begin in our discussion? Thank you, Charlie. And it's always great fun to work with you, particularly on this, this topic. And, and as, as Lee mentioned, we've been doing this for a while. Well, let's start. And I have to say, we must begin with a very simple but very important concept. And you know, we've heard it all before. That is, there is no magic bullet to improve the success, retention, or persistence of our students. There is no one program, initiative, activity, or strategy that will make significant differences by themselves in your retention or persistence rate. The issues of student success are complex. They're complicated and even frustrating because what works on one campus may fail on another. What works with one student population may have no effect on the success of a different population. We do know this, however, Starting the journey to improve the success of your students based on careful analysis of the research in the field, of your institution and your students, and of the changes in the student experience you want to make on your campus. Are the changes to be made at the macro level or the micro level? Institutions that have not taken the time to do this analysis have normally very little change except at a very cursory level in the educational experiences, experiences of their students. And this translates into very little change in their success. Many of you have heard me quote, or to be more precise, many of you have heard me quoting Charlie, who often quotes the famous jazz performer Charles Mingus, who said, making the simple complex is commonplace. Making the complex simple, awesomely simple, that is creativity. Maneuvering the path to student success on your campus takes creativity and hard work on the part of the entire campus community. 
As I think about this quote and, and, and the path maneuvering metaphor, I'm reminded of what a colleague in facilities management went to, once told me about campus walkways. He said, put them where students walk. You might have to wait a little bit, but the paths will soon become evident and actually may bear no relationship to the path you wanted them to take in the first place. I think there is a significant corollary here. Both useful ways and student success require us to pay attention. It is by paying attention that the right pathways for action emerge. So let's first pay attention to what we know about student retention and persistence in our colleges and universities. First, we know that only half, 51% of students who enrolled at four-year institutions in 1995-1996 completed their bachelor's degrees within six years at the same institution they started. We can add another 7% to that completing figure if we look at students who completed within six years after attending two or more four-year institutions. For the traditionally served populations, persistence to graduation is even lower, with 46% of, of African-American students and Latinos completing a degree at a four-year institution within six years. First to second year retention rates are not much higher, with only 66% of first year college students in 2007-2008 returning to this institution the second year overall. At community colleges, 54% of first year college students return to the same institution the second year. These data are not new to anyone listening, I'm sure, but they definitely demonstrate that institutions must begin to analyze their services, their programs, and their organizational structures in order to significantly impact the success of students. Let's take a few minutes and outline the variety of factors and initiatives cited in the literature and the research that have been determined to be important to student retention and persistence. Charlie, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Susan. So let's look at that literature and research identifies the following factors as being important to retention. Intentional and focused first-year advising for all students. Orientation for credit and required tutoring and academic advising throughout the student's educational career. Swartz and Washington determined that the following were predictors for the academic success of students. Personal emotional adjustment, social adjustment, Availability of a strong support person on campus, often the academic advisor, and a high school GPA. Hickson Ball, Pearson, and Williams, our international colleagues from the UK, found that students want academic advising that will help them create connections, feel supported, and become integrated into the college community. Swall found in a summary of the literature and research into student retention that there were three themes that affect student retention and persistence, academic preparedness, campus climate, and commitment to achieving educational goals and to the institution. Ento indicates the institutional factors that have direct effect on student success are high expectations for students, support at all levels, academic advising, involvement in all campus learning experiences, and a student learning focused culture. Bean and Eaton's work on developing a psychological model of college student retention adds a really interesting dimension to the research on student success. Their work is grounded in attitude behavior theory that link attitudes and intentions with behavior. They also consider coping behavioral theory, which focuses on adaptive behavior. Self-efficacy theory, which speaks to the individual's perception of his or her skills and abilities. And attribution theory, which considers locus of control issues. In Seidman's book, College Student Retention, Bean summarizes his approach to student retention. He says, 
there is one major difference between my approach to studying student retention and that based on Tinto's model, and that is related to attitudes. I have found that students evaluate their experiences and form attitudes toward the college that influence their intentions to stay enrolled and their intentions to stay or leave. Anyone and everyone on campus can affect those attitudes. And for this reason, everyone on campus is responsible for retention. As you can see in the next slide, Bean goes on to say, the assessment of retention programs needs to be based not only on what these academic or co-curricular programs are supposed to accomplish, but on whether in providing their services, staff and faculty members shape students' attitudes toward the institution in a positive fashion. Their work, in our opinion, provides us with a critical information piece to help shape our interactions with students, something that we know is key to their success. So, if we know retention and persistence rates have not significantly increased over time. But we see that research indicates what factors, including academic advising, are affecting student success. What can we then in our colleges and universities do differently to truly make a difference? Susan and I want to submit to you that we need to stop tinkering around the edges and begin with the fundamentals and that is, institutions must clearly define the terms retention, persistence, and success for their campuses and their students. So, Susan, let's talk about those definitions for a few minutes. Thanks, Charlie. Now, before we start with this, let me highlight something for everyone. Lest you think we are only talking about undergraduate students during this webinar, think again. The literature seems to point to graduate students having the same affiliation needs as graduate students. This means that advising, and deeper than that, mentoring, is extremely important for graduate students. We're also not just talking about students on site. We're talking about distance learners as well. In fact, we're talking about all students here. Okay, let's go back to definitions. As you all know, some of this is defined for us. For example, we know that the National Center for Education Statistics, as reported through the ever familiar iPads, determines retention by tracking first time, full time students in degree programs over time. Specifically, six years for a baccalaureate degree and three years for an associate's degree to determine whether the student completed a degree program. Parenthetically, it is important to note that some organizations like CSRDE, the Consortium for Student Retention Data Exchange out of the University of Oklahoma, has expanded this tracking to eight years. For many institutions, Expanding to eight years is a really good thing. And in fact, many of us look at these data, at least at baccalaureate institutions, uh, over a 10-year period. However, it perhaps goes without saying that institutions serious about retention must look further than first-time, full-time students in order to support the needs of the transfer students and part-time students, which can significant populations on many of our campuses. Understanding the enrollment, persistence, and graduation patterns, including time to degree, of segments of our student population is really essential to affecting changes that support the whole. For example, let me ask some questions. What is, and do you know this, what is the persistence and graduation rate for your first generation college students? How about your Native American students? Males? Females, students in STEM programs, distance learners. What is the average time to degree for students who complete their degrees within a particular year? And this is different than cohort tracking. 
which populations are faring well, which ones are not faring so well. What is the difference in the student experiences of those doing well versus those not doing well? Are there things the institution can do or stop doing that will support improvement in student success? Let me provide an example of time to degree information. In Maine, the Melmac Education Foundation has not only provided funding for student success initiatives at Maine institutions, it has gathered important data regarding time to degree. Their analysis on this slide that's drawn from the condition of education in 2003, their analysis identifies the average number of years different student groups take to complete a degree. For example, students over the age of 30 years on average take 10.3 years to complete a baccalaureate degree. First generation students take on average 5.2 years. This compared to students with a college educated parent who take only 4.3 years to complete a degree. This information, this type of information, serves as a powerful benchmark for Maine as we try to increase the number of students who enter and graduate from college. MELMAC is serving as a repository for this kind of information and data analysis to help those of us at Maine institutions understand our performance in relationship to national data, and they are developing a profile for Maine institutions as well. Okay, let's go back to definitions. One accepted definition for student retention is the ability of an institution to retain students from admission through graduation, and for student persistence, the desires and actions of a student to stay within the system of higher education from beginning through degree completion. These definitions are important, and they're important because they affirm two things. The first is that embedded in the concept of retention is degree completion. The second is that retention is affected by student interactions with the institution. The institution then needs to make decisions about those factors, processes, systems, programs, etc., over which it has some control in order to influence student persistence toward degree completion, such as graduation. Folks, this is basic Nessie Sessi 101. What does the institution currently do or not do that either negatively or positively affects the student's interaction and, in turn, his or her relationship with the institution? By the same token, we cannot forget that there are really two dimensions to the college experience. Again, this is more Nessie Sessi 101. One is the institution and the other is the student. We know that students enter our doors with myriad skills, interests, abilities, and commitments, one of which is the commitment to completing or not completing his or her degree at our institution. Charlie, let's look at what the research tells us a little bit more about the notion of commitment. Okay, so let's begin with John Bean's research on the psychology of leaving. Bean found that the intention to leave or stay is the best predictor of actual student departure. Think about this for a moment in relation to your own student population. What portion of your entering student body starts college with the intention to leave? How many actually articulate this in language such as, well, I'm starting here, but I'll be transferring, or this was my safety school. I'll be leaving when I get those 30 hours. These statements reveal a student's lack of commitment to your institution. The real question for us then is, what are we at our institutions doing to positively influence a student's commitment to degree completion as well as their commitment to our institutions. These two pieces, student level of commitment to degree completion and the institution, 
And the institutional response to this commitment, meaning the culture and climate of our institutions, interact to affect retention. Seidman states that to be successful, intervention programs, services, and initiatives must be powerful enough to affect change in the institution and change in the student. Tinto has long contended that retention is not the goal. The goal is providing quality educational experiences that affect the commitment to students and that are a result of changes in the institution. He goes on to say, the extent that students become academically and socially integrated into the formal and informal academic and social systems of an institution often will determine their departure decisions. Koo states that student success must be defined broadly in order to include things such as academic achievement, the engagement in educationally purposeful activities, satisfaction, acquisition of desired knowledge, skills, and competencies, persistence, attainment of educational goals, and post-college performance. Simon suggests that retention is determined by the early identification of students' abilities, commitment, and goals, combined with early, intensive, and continuous interventions, which affect both the institution and the student. Lee, I want you to hold on to this slide for a moment. And Susan, I want to take a few minutes before we go on to give one real world example of how institutions can utilize the information we've talked about so far. On a variety of institutions, early alert and our programs focused at students who are experiencing academic difficulty in their first semester or their first year have been implemented to, to improve the success of these students, thus improving their retention and persistence. Well, many of these programs have had little success or very limited success with these students' long-term retention and persistence to graduation. I believe that the reason for this failure or at least limited success of such programs can be clearly tied to the following. First, the institutions had not done deep and intensive study of students being targeted in these programs. Therefore, these programs were built for students that we know little in-depth information about, often other than perhaps that they're experiencing difficulty in their classes at this moment. We must first fully research who our students are before we develop programs. Then, not only do we know little about these students, often early alert type programs are developed without any research done on the factors that affect the success of the students on that particular campus. What factors do the students on your campus bring? What factors does, does your institution create negatively or positively, that affect retention and persistence based on things like your institutional size, mission, student body, culture, history. Third, while early alert programs or similar ones may focus on study skills, habits, and or time management, they do not always have a clear focus on analyzing and dealing with the student's commitment to their education or degree or the institution. Thus, while their grades might increase, the students are no more likely to be successful in the long term due to commitment issues. And finally, many alert or similar programs are not powerful enough to significantly make change in either the institution or the student. Therefore, they have little or no impact on students' overall success, retention, or persistence. Utilizing the literature and the research, institutions can get a handle 
on why their early alert programs may be having little long-term effect and can begin to make significant changes in the nature and scope of those programs. Or, perhaps even better, they could develop programs initially, having done the research and study I suggested moments ago. Charlie, I, let me jump in here because I, I absolutely agree with you. We must design and tailor programs and systems such as Early Alert to be responsive to the factors affecting our students. Let us also suggest that, you know, there are campuses that have found their Early Alert systems to be highly successful. We submit that these programs are theoretically grounded, intentionally designed to be responsive to the risk factors affecting their students, and focused on those issues that if addressed, are most likely to yield positive results. Here's a, diff a different kind of example, and I think a good one. A good one would be the targeting of performance in gateway courses and directing those students who are not performing well toward advising and career exploration, particularly if their original plan was to major in that course area. This practice also extends the utility of early alert systems beyond single course performance. Again, Charlie, I think you, you gave a great example of how to apply theory, and I absolutely wholeheartedly agree. And I also encourage those campuses with effective early alert systems to share their designs, to share how they utilized research and analysis in those designs, and also to share their successes with others uh, of us uh, through the house. So let me give it back to you, Charlie. Thanks for letting me uh, chime in. No problem, Susan, at all. Um, and those of you interested in sharing that information with us through the Clearinghouse on your successes can do so by sending that information to Marsha Miller at miller at ksu.edu. So where does academic advising fit in all this? As demonstrated by the research, Academic advising is integral to the retention, persistence, and student success initiatives on a campus. Tinto states that good academic advising is one of the key components that promotes retention and persistence to a degree, for it reflects an institutional's commitment to the education of its students. Hence, academic advising is one initiative that can both change the culture of an institution and have positive effects on students' commitment to their educations and their institution. Now, we all know the significance of Richard Light's research that clearly identified the effectiveness of students' relationships and experiences as key to their success and the lack of effective relationships key to less successful college experiences. Coup indicates academic advising is a way to connect students to the campus and help them feel that someone's looking out for them. So if research continues to demonstrate the relation of academic advising to student retention, persistence, and success, how do we utilize this knowledge to make effective changes on our campus that enhance students' educational experiences and thus increase their persistence and, pers and retention rates. Well, we want to spend the remaining time with you today outlining some key strategies and techniques, like the one I just discussed earlier, that you can utilize on your own campus, as well as some examples of key initiatives involving academic advising that research shows have positively affected student success. Susan, I'll give it back to you. Thanks, Charlie. Um, and as we go through these next sections, uh, Charlie, if you have any comments that you'd like to add, please feel free to uh, to chime in, as I clearly took the liberty to chime in during your, your section of, of the presentation. Well, folks, we've identified five key conditions to support the role of advising in student success, and we'd like to share them with you. First, we must recognize that good, effective academic advising does not on its own increase the success of our students. All the research we have pointed to 
clearly states that academic advising is a key or integral or essential component of any student retention or persistence efforts, but will not on its own change students or the institutional culture. Therefore, the very first thing that we have to do is to identify all those areas, units, departments, offices, as well as all the variety of faculty, staff, and administrators on campus that we must or with whom we must build partnerships and collaborative relationships. Academic advising centers, offices, or units cannot be silos working in isolation from the rest of the campus. If you have a faculty advising model, faculty advisors must identify all the areas of the campus they must connect with in order to be a part of the success of their advisees. After we've determined with whom we should partner, we then must begin to analyze the types of partnerships we need to develop because collaborative efforts must have clearly defined purpi or have a clearly defined purpose and clearly defined expected outcomes for these efforts. And I want to emphasize here that these efforts are particularly critical for supporting students who are learning at a distance, whether that be online or via other mediums as well. Second, successful retention and persistence efforts and initiatives are built upon both grassroots efforts and top-down initiatives. This is very important to the success of any effort. Top administrators, chancellors, presidents, provosts, vice presidents, as well as the deans and their associate deans must be in support of and communicate on a regular basis the importance of the efforts being implemented on a campus. They must lead the charge for change. They must encourage the types of analysis we discussed earlier and must be intentional in their leadership to provide both the support for and time for this analysis. Impatience on the part of a campus for change, well, as many of us may know, often results in change for change's sake or change based on little analysis and thus ultimately has little effect. Top administrators should foster a culture of student success and inquiry into the success of our students through their conversations and through their act on campus. As academic advisors and academic advising administrators, we must consistently communicate with senior administrators about the value and connections that academic advising has to all the efforts on the campus to increase retention and persistence rates as demonstrated both in the literature and by the exemplary presence we have all studied and analyzed. Top level administrators may be different for each of us based on our role on a campus, the size and mission of our institution and how broad the initiative or efforts are. In other words, for example, if you work in a college of business at a comprehensive university, top level administrator for you may be the dean of the college, being focused on initiatives directed totally to the students in the college of business. However, if you are working at a two-year community college with an achieving the dream grant to improve the educational experiences of all students and thus their retention and persistence, Top-level administrator may be the president or chancellor in his or her cabinet of key leaders on the campus. As an adv academic advisor and academic advising administrator, you need to determine with whom you need to keep in regular contact. Because initiatives will not be successful without the involvement and support of those on the ground, faculty, staff, and administrators not just advising centers, not just top level administrators, but administrators, faculty, and staff across the institution. Top level administrators are unable on their own to improve the educational experiences of students on campus. It must involve all those who touch students' lives on a daily basis. While the vision and key decisions for retention assistance efforts must involve senior administrators, they will not be successful if the stakeholder constituencies on campus are not actively engaged. 
The campus community must share the vision and foster the culture of student success through their actions, through their planning, and through their work with students. It truly is only by working together will our initiatives and strategies have any chance of making significant changes in our student success. Third, there must be clear leadership, and frankly, a clear leader with the responsibility for the retention and persistence efforts on a campus and the authority to bring together a variety of efforts across the campus. So here, this does not mean this leader is solely responsible for student success. Instead, this leader needs to be responsible for coordinating the efforts across the campus. Once again, the size, complexity, and mission of the institution and the expansiveness of the efforts may define who or what is identified as the leader. However, institutions serious about improving the educational experiences for students, thereby improving their retention and persistence, have figured out ways to do this step. And they've figured out how to do it in a variety of ways. Some examples, some institutions have identified a senior administrator, such as the provost or vice president, and the responsibilities for all retention and persistence efforts across the institution. Here's an example on Charlie's former campus, the vice president for academic affairs and the vice president for student development were jointly given this responsibility and authority. And in this way, they were sending, the institution was sending a clear message to the campus that student success and student learning, not just an academic or just a student services role, but instead the role and responsibility of the entire campus working in partnership. Other campuses have created an Office of Student Retention and Success with a director or even a dean level position, and that person has the responsibility and authority for coordinating the efforts on campus. At institutions with very decentralized governance structures, such as comprehensive institutions, the efforts at the college may all be at the college level, so that the dean or associate assistant dean may have the responsibility. And at other campuses, student retention councils, committees, or task forces have been named in responsibility and authority for efforts across the campus. The councils, committees, or task forces are comprised of representatives from every key unit on campus so that you actually have in one room the people who have the authority to make decisions or changes for issues affecting the quality, educational experiences of students, as well as solutions for those issues. Here's a specific example of clear leadership. The University of Tennessee Knoxville is one institution that has utilized the council model extremely well under the leadership of for former Nakata President Ruth Darling. Whatever your model, your campus chooses to, to utilize, the key is that everyone on campus must be able to identify the one person or unit with the responsibility and authority for efforts and initiatives. This means there should never be a blank stare when people are asked, who is responsible for coordinating retention and persistence issues on this campus? The responsibility should be clear and a person office identified. By the same token, there should never be a blank stare when people are asked, who is responsible for student persistence and success on this campus? The response, regardless of the audience, should also be clear. We all are. Fourth, Initiatives for the improvement of student retention and persistence cannot be quiet, cannot be under the radar on a campus. Successful initiatives create a buzz of continual conversation on stu about student success at the institution. We in academic advising must be key players to creating this buzz and key players in these conversations. We must be consistently discussing academic advising plays an integral and essential part in student success and the quality of their educational experiences. But our discussions must also help create that buzz about partnering and collaborating with others on campus. 
because we know that quality academic adv advising alone does not create student success. It's like the old idea of not keeping your candle under a basket. Our flames of student success and retention have to be out in the open and must create excitement. Academic advising in the end not only connects students to campuses, to campus people, to programs and to services, it serves as a connector among people, programs and services. A number of years ago, some research was done on the role of mid-level managers in higher education. The term linking pin was used to describe how mid-level managers keep things connected on a campus. In many ways, I think, and Charlie thinks, academic advice is also a linking pin, intentionally connecting people, programs, and services in ways that will enhance and enrich a student's educational experience. So how can we highlight <clears throat> excuse me, this linking pin role for partnership development. A few specific strategies that each of you can on campus to keep the buzz and, com and conversation alive could be any of these. How about this one? Formalize a campaign for advising for student success. Clarify the role of advising and supporting student success and keep that role visible so that all members of the campus community can get on board. Here's another one. Get the leadership involved, faculty, staff, student governance bodies. In collaboration with our student senate, we created a joint senate leadership team to support student success. In June, the team comprised of the leadership of the student senate, faculty senate, professional staff senate, and classified staff senate hosted a campus-wide conversation about academic advising. We had 120 people participate in this all-day conference. Over 30 faculty participated, which is really significant because faculty are not on contract during the summer months. This effort signaled to us the tremendous campus-wide support that exists for academic advising. We left the day with an action plan for the Senate for this next year. Earlier, I mentioned the Melmac Education Foundation. Well, we used some of our Melmac monies to support this activity. And we also received contributions from the provost's office and the, the Office of Student Financial Aid, who actually paid for all of the materials used during that day. So here's another one. On a regular basis, whether it be monthly, weekly, once a semester, share across the campus an article from the Nakata Clearinghouse, Academic Advising Today, or the Nakata Journal that demonstrates how academic advising is key to the retention and persistence efforts on campus, or outlines an exemplary practice or successful initiative utilized on another campus. Finally, when you or your colleagues are able to attend a conference workshop or webinar concerning student success, you know, find formal and intentional ways of sharing the ideas, information, and strategies you've learned with the whole campus community. Don't just share it within your office or unit. Be sure this sharing always includes your top administrators. Essentially, and in essence, you must take on the role and responsibility of being the expert in our field of study, because you are. And our field of study is academic advising. And if you do this, this will help to ensure that you are part of that campus buzz and the conversation about student success. Fifth. We must collectively identify the factors that can affect positively or negatively student success, retention, and persistence on our campus. What are the protocols for working with students? How are students referred? To where? If they come to you, where else have they? What follow-up is done with the student and or the place to which the student was referred? If the student comes in to see you about an issue, where have they been? Have they been anywhere else on campus asking about this issue? All this is to say that we cannot develop initiatives or new programs if not taken the important step of analyzing who our students are 
and understand how they experience our campuses. We must analyze honestly and openly what our strengths and weaknesses we have on our institutions and what, how, what those strengths and weaknesses may have in regard to how we are affecting the success of our students. It is imperative that we conduct an evaluation of our academic advising experiences and, and the programs across our institutions or colleges or our units. What do we have in place to minimize the barriers students may face? And what do we have in place to maximize their strengths and capitalize on our own institution's strengths? Such evaluations or audits might be completed using the CAS standards for academic advising, the Council for the Advancement of Standards. And in fact, Charlie will be making a webinar presentation on this topic with Nakata past president Eric White in December. Some campuses have also utilized Nakata's academic advising consultant and speaker service to conduct an evaluation of academic advising. Whatever process is utilized, analysis of factors is essential. You cannot simply adapt a successful student success or retention program from another institution and expect it to be as successful on your campus as the program may not be focused on the factors affecting your students and your institution. The NCAA has recently introduced a new initiative, CAUG, which has as its base identification of the risk factors student athletes face as they enter an institution and what initiatives the institution has in place to minimize those risk factors. The process is utilized as the student athlete moves to their sophomore year, to their junior year, and to their senior year. Would it not be powerful if an institution did that level of analysis for all of their students? What risk factors do the students on your campus face? At what level, at what point in their development? and what point in their college career. How do you know this? What analysis have you conducted? What can the impact of these risk factors have the success of your students? And what initiatives do you have in place or can you put in place to deal with those risk factors? What partnerships can academic advisors to develop to collaborate on addressing such, such initiatives and issues? Charlie. Let's now spend some time analyzing specific initiatives that the work of researchers and practitioners such as George Koo, John Gardner, Vince Tinto, and AAC and U's LEAP initiative have identified as being high impact and having positive influence on students' educational experiences and in turn their retention and persistence. Let's also talk about how academic advising can support and connect students to these entities and how it can partner with others to support student involvement in them. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Susan. What wonderful ideas and wonderful thoughts um, for our audience today to have heard. So thank you so much for sharing that. Well, first and foremost, quality academic advising has in its foundation the role and responsibility of teaching students and guiding students toward the experiences that will enhance their educational experiences at our institutions. Therefore, academic advisors and academic advising units must be intimately involved with these identified high impact practices and initiatives. Now, these include those you presently see on your screen. First year seminars and experiences, common intellectual experiences, learning communities, writing intensive courses, collaborative assignments and projects, undergraduate research, diversity and global learning, service learning, community-based learning, internships, capstone courses and projects. So let's start by taking a closer look at a few of these. Let's talk about their prevalence or emerging presence on our campuses and then consider the role that academic advising and academic advisors must play in supporting these high impact activities. Let's start first with our first year seminars, learning communities and service learning. It will come as no surprise to any of us that the National Resource Center for the First Year Experience and Students in Transition 
has done some pretty exhaustive tracking and analysis of the growth and dimensions of first-year seminar courses over the years. In the seventh National Survey of First-Year Seminar Programming conducted in 2006, the Resource Center found that 84.8% of the responding institutions indicated that they offered a first-year seminar. Of the, of the 828 institutions responding, 301 or 367 indicated that academic planning or advising was one of the five most important topics in the seminar. What is perhaps more interesting is that many campuses seem to use the seminar as a way to also engage students in the other high impact activities. In particular, learning communities with 35.3 of the seminars indicated they were linked this to one or more courses. And service learning with 40.2% with seminars reporting that service learning was included as part of the first year seminar content. Susan, I think it's worth taking a few minutes now to do a little polling of our participants, particularly because I think we can always use each other as resources and partners as we pursue student success initiatives. So Lee, can you put up our first question? So the question here is, do you require some are all of your students to first year seminar? Now we want you to respond either yes or no and respond by your type two year college, a four year public, a four year private, um, some other type of educational um, organization. But we want you to take a few minutes and do that polling for us and answer that question to each of your sites. Now, as we look at the results of these polls, we're going to focus on the number of responses, not the percentages, as the percentages are going to reflect the percentage of all the respondents in the room today, not just those in the institutional type, if that makes sense to you. Um, that's about as mathematical as this English major can get um, to explain percentage and those aspects. We know that first-year seminar programs across the country and internationally, not just in the U.S., but across the world, these programs are becoming very much a part of the fabric of colleges. So let's look at what we see here. Well, we see in our group today, 17 of our two-year colleagues, yes, require it, 16 don't. 41% of our four-year public do, 32 do not. 24% of our private do. Um, and eight of our private do not. And then four of our other colleagues and one of our other colleagues does not. It's very interesting, I think, to look at that four-year private numbers. That's significantly um, a lot, much larger number requiring than not requiring. So that may tell us a little bit about uh, how an institution has to fit with its type of mission and student in making programs and designing programs. So let's look at our second question. If you do offer a first-year program, have you found this experience linked to the persistence to the second year? Once again, let's answer yes or no based on your institutional type. And notice here on this question, it doesn't say require, it says offer. And we particularly use that difference in terminology because we wanted to get everyone's involvement on this question that regardless of its, whether it's an elective or a suggested course or whether it's a course that's just simply, or whether it's a course that's required, we wanted to see how many of you have found this course to be linked to, be linked to persistence. One of the things I bet you're discussing on your campus right now is the fact that you believe it con is connected to the persistence but you're not sure you really have the data to support that yet, or that you have data that supports aspects with maybe one group of students or another group of students, because sometimes the data we gather doesn't always indicate what we think it's going to. So it'll be interesting to see as more of you respond to this, what we find out in the response to it. 
as we know, first year seminar courses are not always um, are, are not always thought about in relation to being a full first year program. So that on many of your campuses, you have not only a first year seminar course, but you have a full fledged first year program, which includes lots of activities dealing with the first year student, not just one course. So let's look at what we have here. We see that seven of our two year institutions have found it to be connected, 11 have not found that, that connection. 37 have found it of our public, 14 of our private have not, um, excuse me, of our public have not. 15 private institutions have, seven have not one of our other type of institutions, and then six of our other have not. So we see that many of our colleagues are still researching and are going and looking at data to indicate the success of these courses in relation to persistence to the second year. Let's look at the third question, Lee. If you do offer a first year seminar, once again, offer, not require, do you link it in one or more link it in some way with one or more courses to create learning communities? Now note, this question doesn't mean do you link every single course, but do you have any examples on your campus where a learning community is formed specifically by linking a first year seminar course with other academic courses? I recently had the opportunity to work with Minnesota State and Technical College in Moorhead, Minnesota. And they're initiating a really exciting pilot this fall of a learning community with their first year seminar. And it's truly going to be culture changing in how they're developing it, how the faculty are working together, and how the students are going to work together across courses on various assignments and various readings. Um, I think it's going to really be a major culture shift on that campus as they work with that. So out of our institutions that responded, seven of our two-year colleagues um, have done that, 17 have not. 41 of our four-year have, 17 have not. Nine of our private have, but 20 have not. And then one of our um, other types of institutions has, and six have not. Um, I think it's very interesting to note that while the four-year institutions had many more programs that were required, we see much less of them doing the linking. That's just an interesting thing within that, uh, with this audience today. Let's look at our next question. If you do offer, once again, not require, but offer a first-year seminar, do you have a service learning experience included in it? I think it'll be interesting to see the response here because on many campuses, I think we could all admit that there may be a um, community service type of activity built into the program. But we know, of course, that the true difference between community service and service learning is that reflection piece, the opportunity for students to reflect upon what they've done out into the community and what they've learned through service. So it's going to be interesting to see how many of you see service learning as truly being a part of that seminar you have on your campus. Got about half of our respondents, or a little more than half. Obviously, I can't do math um, responding here. So let's look at what we have. Four of our two-year do, 23 have not. Um, four, um, of 21 of our four-year public, 41 of our four-year public have not. Um, 11 private have, 18 have not, and, no, and none of our institutions of different types have, but five have not. So I think as you look at these results today, I think you truly see that there are lots of variation among our colleagues out there and lots of institutions doing really some exciting things with connecting, learning the seminar to these high impact activities. Um, Lee, thank you a lot for helping with that polling. And thank all of you for being willing to share what you've done on your campuses. So let's move on. Before we talk about the role of advisors and advising in these high impact activities, I want to take a minute and address three other 
of those high impact, impact activities. Those are the undergraduate research, diversity and global learning, and internships. Plain and simple, faculty-student interaction is enhanced by undergraduate research. We know that. And it's, it's engaged in research at both the undergraduate and graduate levels are more academically challenged and ultimately more satisfied with the college experience. A number of institutions are finding new ways to encourage and promote undergraduate and graduate research, and many begin this promotion of this research at the very front end of a student's experiences. Students who have been involved in conversations and dialogue with others who are different from them are more enriched by their college experience. The research on global learning, particularly studying away, finds that these experiences are life-changing ones. I'm sure there are many of you in, the, in our viewing audience today who could speak to that type of experience in your own college career. Campuses are finding ways to promote these types of experiences, even if life circumstances of our students prevent them from physically going away, we find ways to bring that cultural diversity and those cultural experiences to the campuses. I'm excited to say that many of you may be aware that NACADA has recently, recently recognized our emphasis on global learning by adding a tagline that reflects our commitment to the global community, and that is NACADA, the global community for academic advising. And I'm delighted to say, as Lee, to announce as Lee did at the beginning, and welcome our colleagues from South Africa who are with us today in this broadcast, representing that global connection Nakata has. And then last, internships. They provide students with the opportunity to apply what they have learned in the classroom in some really authentic ways. Internships also, and something particularly important to our first generation students, they help students see what see how what they're studying relates to their future. Internships make real what to at this point may only have been imagined. So what are the advisors and advising programs role in these high impact activities? Well, as the linking pins, we should and can do what George Koo says that research tells us to do. And that is we can direct students toward the right activities, those high impact activities, those activities that hold the most potential to positively influence learning and in turn persistence toward graduation. That is the critical part of our job in academic advising. The high impact activities ought to reinforce that the college experience is more than just a classroom experience. Although make no mistake, the classroom experience is central to college success, but it is more than just the classroom. And as academic advisors, we have an obligation to our students to understand this simple fact of the matter. We also have an obligation to define in collaboration with others on our campus, to understand in collaboration with others on our campus, the key components of, and to be able to articulate to students what is the college experience at your university or experience? And then what of these experiences will help enrich and support our students at our college? What's critical today and what's critical here as we end this webinar to make sure you understand is very simple. We must have definitions and descriptions of students' experiences on our campuses. This definition defines what we believe to be important. This goes beyond the classroom. Things such as, do we expect students to participate in internships? Do we expect students to study abroad? Do we expect students to develop a partnership with their academic advisors? And if we expect them to, how do we communicate that 
on our campuses, to develop a partnership with someone who will assist them in making the important connections between what they are studying and what they imagine their futures to be. Someone who will direct them toward the right activities to enrich their college experience and set them on the paths to rewarding lives in a democratic society. If so, then all of us in this webinar audience today and all of us in higher education must clearly conceptualize academic advising as integral to the teaching and learning missions of our institutions. And we must embrace the role of linking pen to connect students to learning and to break down those socially constructed silos that serve as barriers to cooperation and collaboration on our campuses, and last, to create the changes in our students' attitudes and commitments and the changes in our institutional cultures that will support student retention and student persistence. Well, that ends our presentation for today. Um, we want to thank all of you for being here. I'm going to turn the mic back over to Lee as we prepare for the question and answer part of the segment today. So, Lee, I'll give it back to you. Okay, well, uh, it seems that the construction folks have gone into high gear right outside my window, so I'm just going to take two seconds and go real quickly through today as Marsha brings those questions to Charlie. Uh, we want to thank everybody for attending the broadcast. You will receive your evaluation first thing tomorrow morning in your email, so we ask you to fill that out for us, please. Um, as we said at the uh, beginning of the broadcast, uh, we do have CDs available of all our previous ones, and we will have one of this available for you as well, so we hope you'll want that. And we also hope that if you haven't already done so, that you will sign up for our next event, which will take place on November 18th. So I'm going to turn the mic back to you, Charlie, for the question and answer period now. Okay. Um, Susan, we've got some really good questions here. Let's begin with a question that was sent from um, before the broadcast to us from our friends at North Central University. And that is they'd like to know if there are different strategies or approaches that promote retention with our adult students. So, Susan, I'll let you start on that question. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I think what we want to do as we answer these questions is, is relate back to the research um, and the literature that we were, were trying to present during today's, today's webinar. Adult students are first and foremost students. Yes. Um, the kinds of strategies, it is, it is our belief that you use are very similar <laughs> to the ones that you use for any student. What we need to address, however, particularly with adult students, are the life circumstances that they may be facing, which means that we need to take into consideration what the, the, the issues they have related to the thing, the other kinds of commitments that they have in their lives, it means that we need to be responsive and use different kinds of modalities and perhaps different times uh, in order to address their particular needs. Charlie, you want to add a little bit to that? Yes, I think one of the things that we have to look at with adult students is recognizing that we have to to truly expect from them the same level of commitment and the same level of, of dedication to their studies. Uh, many times we allow adult students, I think, to get away with the concept of, of classroom, parking lot classroom, um, the, because of their busy lives. We know they have busy lives but that their lives cannot keep them from committing to their success. So while the activities might be different in working with our adult students, we still have to find those high impact activities that build their commitment to their academic success and to their persistence to graduation. And that becomes very important. Um, Susan, we have another question. Um, which is, would you define for the audience um, the definition of intentional advising? 
Charlie, that's one of my favorite questions because I, I think that as we have continued in Nakata to define academic advising as an integral part of higher education or of, of teaching and learning, uh, in fact, we need to treat academic advising in, in very similar ways to that we treat a classroom. Uh, that's why I'm so, I'm always very excited when campuses start thinking about putting or, or actually do put together syllabi for academic advising. Intentional means just that, intentional, that the, the activities and um, expectations and outcomes that you have for academic advising, the academic advising process uh, are closely connected to the outcomes and expectations you have for the overall student experience. And that the you spend time mapping out, that's part of what we were talking about earlier, that you have you map out the student experience from the point of acceptance through graduation. And you identify those kinds of high impact activities or, or those key activities that will enhance and enrich a student's experience and identify the processes and the conversations that you need to have with students in order to help them achieve their educational career life goals. So when we start talking about academic advising as an intentional experience or intentional academic advising, we're also talking about it in a developmental sense, that we're looking at what do students need, and, and actually the academic advising handbook has um, some some great chapters on this. What are, are the students' needs as they enter through and exit our institutions? What are the expectations that we have for experiences that students need to have some uh, familiarity with or participate in that we think are really important to um, and and will add value to the their college experience. We know classroom classes are are part of that, and we know that through intentional advising, we can talk with students about the the course offerings and maximize and enrich their experience just by talking about their goals, their aspirations, and the kinds of classes that the institution has that will enhance and enrich the student experience. And we also need to look at what other kinds of things, what other experiences, curricular and co-curricular, will add value. Uh, and that's what I mean by intentional academic advising. That's probably more than anybody wanted to hear. But Charlie, would you like to add to that as well? Um, yes, Susan, I think you did a beautiful job with that. I'll just go and a little further very quickly and say one thing and that is assigning students an academic advisor and requiring them to see an academic advisor does not constitute intentional advising and for many campuses they believe if they do that then they're creating intentionality that's not what it is um, we only have five minutes we've got a couple of questions i'm going to respond to kind of quickly and that is, um, one person asked, do we have any evaluations or surveys that we could use to explore student satisfaction with programs within our colleges? I would encourage you to go to the Nakata website, to the Assessment um, Commission, or to Assessment of Advising in the Clearinghouse. And there are examples of a variety of surveys that, that different campuses have used, and a variety of surveys that have been developed specifically for that reason. So I encourage you to look at the clearinghouse. If you need some assistance with that or want to know exactly where you might go, um, I would encourage you to contact Marsha Miller, once again, miller at ksu.edu. And then the last question I'll just jump to very, very quickly and we'll look at is someone say, can you give an example of service learning? And probably the example I use the most is, is kind of a, a simple one, but community service would be cleaning the side of the road on a Saturday morning. Service learning would be cleaning the side of the road on a Saturday morning, but then being required to reflect upon what you learned from that, how you worked with other people who were involved, 
and how you felt like that enhanced your own community and your own society. That's kind of the difference between the two. Um, Lee, I'm going to turn it back to you because we are through with our question and answer period. Um, I want to once again, Lee, thank you for all the work you've done for all of the webinar casts. I'd like to take a moment to thank Gary Cunningham, our tech guru, for the work he does, Marsha Miller for all of her assistance, and the entire Nakata staff because it takes all of us to do these webinars and put them on. And then last, once again, Susan, as always, you're phenomenal and a thrill to work with. So, Lee, back to you. I'd also like to say thank you to Susan coming to us from Maine today. Thank you, Charlie, for all of the great work that you do for all of us. Thanks to all of our viewers for your support and for being with us today. And I think that wraps things up.